Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto Podcast. Entertainment news and reviews without the woke Hollywood narrative. Free speech, free expression. Now that's entertainment. And here's your host, award-winning film critic, Christian Toto. This week on the Hollywood and Toto Podcast, we remember why Howard Stern once mattered and why he's just hopeless on one of the biggest fights of our time. We speak to Marcus Pittman. He's the CEO of Lure TV. That's the new Christian platform that promises shows that are unfiltered by Hollywood or church ladies. Yeah, that got my attention, too. And we celebrate one of the better recent comedies, in part because they don't make many theatrical comedies these days. My love for the old Howard Stern bordered on religious fanaticism. You want to know how extreme I got? I used to park my car at work each morning and I'd pop in a 90-minute audio cassette into my boombox. I'd turn on his show, hit record, and then go to work. On the way home, I would listen to 45 minutes of Howard Stern's show that I hadn't heard before. Pretty extreme, right? I did it day after day after day. But those days are gone. Starting with cassette tapes, my gosh, how did I, I just dated myself in an extreme fashion. But that Howard Stern is also gone. He's no more. Now, Howard is nearly 70 these days, but he's 69, and he no longer pushes the envelope like he once did. No more strippers coming in and out of his studio. You know, that's fine. I get that. We all get older, except Tom Cruise, apparently. But, you know, you have to grow up at some point. But the new Howard Stern also abandoned other things from his past, the stuff that maybe he shouldn't have. The biggest change to me, he no longer fights for free speech like he once did. I think maybe his most infamous moment the last few years was when he cursed out anyone who didn't want the COVID-19 vaccine a couple of years ago. Now, I know the vaccine is a hot-button issue. I'm no scientist. I'm not going to go there at this point. But just listen to Howard Stern lecturing those who doubted the medicine would be their best course of action. When are we going to stop putting up with the idiots in this country and just say you now it's mandatory to get vaccinated? F*** them, f*** their freedom. I want my freedom to live. I got to say, it really hurt this former fan to hear him curse out freedom like that. Just, I mean, it's Schwarzenegger-esque, sadly. Screw your freedom. But more recently, Stern has been echoing a little bit of his old self, just a smidge. But at the same time, he's also showing how out of touch he's become. He came to the defense of his old chum, Donald Trump. Yeah, Donald Trump used to be on his show quite a bit over the president's town hall appearance at CNN. Now, the left raged at CNN letting Trump speak for giving him a platform because too many leftists these days no longer like free speech. They're anti-free speech. And if you think I'm being outrageous, you got to do your homework. Or you can listen to Sonny Hostin on The View explaining her authoritarian views on national television. I think that you don't give a bigot and a racist and a misogynist and a liar and a cheater and a sexual abuser and a a defamer a platform of three million people. And I'm saddened. uh, I used to work for CNN for quite some time. Anderson Cooper has been my friend for over 20 years. And I'm saddened that he tried to gaslight me yesterday by saying that people are in silos. People aren't living in a silo. They are choosing to listen to the lies or not. The Stern, by contrast, had no problem with Trump-CNN alliance. Yeah, I guess everybody's still talking about Trump doing his uh, town hall on CNN. Everybody was, everyone had their uh, in a twist over uh, Trump being on there and the audience was like laughing and, you know, cheering him on and a lot of people got upset about it, but I don't know. I, I thought it was fucking really fucking interesting and entertaining. I'm pretty sure anybody who didn't like Trump hated him even more after that. And maybe some people who don't know what's happened. I mean, his fans love him. And, you know, I, I mean, I thought it was an interesting thing to watch it. Great, Howard, but you still don't get it. The media turned Trump, who was obviously a cartoonish figure with plenty of political skill, into Voldemort 2.0. You cannot speak his name or even hear his opinions. You know, at Stern's core, I I know he's not a fan of this new sentiment, but he's also become part of the MSNBC nation. He's a huge fan. He admitted it last year. And he doesn't really understand the mindset of the modern censor. They are on the far left. They are relentless. 
and they will not be denied. And they don't want Trump to speak or anyone right of center on a college campus. We've seen endless examples of the latter. It's not just about Trump. The modern left hates free speech. They miss the old days at Twitter. Remember when, we, when people would speak their minds and get canceled, when right-leaning voices would just be going away, be shadow banned, or just disappeared? Now Stern, who to me sounds a bit bored by his own banter in that clip, doesn't get the big picture. He's checked out of the culture wars. He's getting his checks from SiriusXM. He doesn't understand that free speech is in jeopardy right now. now the old Stern, the one I listened to, the dude was on the front lines of the free speech battles. Today, he can't even admit there's a fight going on or that it's never been nastier. And the good guys, including Howard Stern 1.0, they're losing bigly. I've been tracking my next guest's passion project for quite a while now, and it is about to arrive. It's called Lore TV, and it's a different kind of Christian platform. Now, Lore TV takes elements of streaming. It's a streaming platform for sure. And a, a, a nugget, a, a pinch of crowdfunding, at least that sentiment, and it brings them together in a fresh, fresh new way. And in the process, Lore TV wants Christian storytellers to be free to tell the stories they want to share. This isn't Pure Flix 2.0. Some of the content's going to be a little bit edgier than some Christians are ready for. That's part of the project. Now, Marcus Pittman is the visionary behind Lower TV, which after a very long buildup, which is understandable, it takes a while to get these things in motion, it's going live at the end of this month. Lower TV gives subscribers a chance to help influence the different projects that they see on the platform for starters. Marcus will explain more about that in a minute. One of the shows out of the gate is called Breaking Laws and is hosted by a gentleman. If you don't know his name, you know his voice. He's the narrator on this show. It's Joseph Granda, and I can't wait to see that one. Some of the crazy laws that are still in the books that he exploits and explores, just a riot. The teaser trail alone is worth the while. For now, let's learn more about Lore TV and how it CEO thinks it could be a game changer in the spiritual space. I suspect he's right. Here's my chat with Lore TV's Marcus Pittman. Marcus, thank you for joining the show. I've been looking forward to talking to you for quite some time now. I know that Lore TV is about to launch, which is exciting, of course, but I was wanting to go back a little bit. I understand that the movie Cuties, which was uh, quite contentious for all the right reasons, honestly, unbelievable that it was on Netflix, played a role in the creation of Lore TV. Can you share a little bit about that and, and how that joined in on, on some thoughts you had already? Yeah, I, I remember. I remember when that happened. I was just completely just shocked and stunned that uh, <laughs> Netflix got away with that um, that sort of show that embraced, you know, sexualized sexualized children and so, that sort of thing. And I was glad that they got a lot of pushback, but there wasn't a lot of uh, there was no options for anybody to go to, right? So like. You know, I, I think an example of this is with the Budweiser thing, right? People people can drop Bud Light and they can pick up a Coors Light, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But when we when we canceled Netflix, we realized well, where's our entertainment options? Yeah, it's a great point. Um, especially for men, um, so there there just weren't any hardly any options there, and so we just we needed to fix that. That was a problem and a uh, big empty space in the market. You know, I think when you talk to entrepreneurs about their vision, what they're accomplishing, it's often, hey, I needed this in the marketplace. It wasn't there. And then I stepped forward. But I think it's one of the best ways to succeed in the space. And that's exactly what you're doing. I love your catchphrase. I know you've used it for a while, unfiltered by Hollywood or church ladies. Now, that may say it all, but I want you to expand on that a little bit because I think that's an important phrase. And I, I think it's evocative in a way, too, which I think is good. Yeah, no, I think a lot of the Christian media, well, first we have to start with, I mean, we know why Hollywood is, is bad. You have all the woke stuff. You have all the, all the sort of, uh, 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 LGBT diversity casting, you know, we have to replace a little mermaid, right? <laughs> like all these sort of things that just don't make sense. Uh, but they're just done to basically up their ES, the, you know, Hollywood's ESG scores. Right. Um, so, so we know that's Hollywood and, and so 
filmmakers aren't being allowed to be able to tell the stories they want in Hollywood, but they're also not being allowed to tell the stories they want among Christian film. Um, a lot of it is determined by whether or not uh, a 40 year old soccer mom will be able to will, will want to watch the content. Well, that's a very narrow market. It's a, it's a very profitable market to make content for them. So I, I would say that Christian films been successful, but they haven't expanded outside of that uh, that sort of category. So when we say that Hollywood is unfiltered by church lady, or, sorry, lore is unfiltered by Hollywood or church ladies, what we're talking about is the Karens in your church that, uh, you know, get upset when there's a gun in a movie because they don't want their kids to be exposed to violence. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and we know that we know that good storytellers uh, demonstrate evil properly and righteously, a righteous display of evil in, in a lot of their stories as well. And and so uh, we also don't want to shield. We don't think we should shield uh especially boys uh, from the, the truths of the world. Uh, now there's different ages. Um, but for example, one of our shows is barely biblical was not allowed to be put on any streaming platform. He kind of just had the, the creator whose name is, um, Oh my gosh, the guy's name. Uh, anyway, the, cre the, the creator, he worked for Phineas and Ferb and he worked for, uh, for, for Mickey Mouse on Disney. Um, and he, uh, and he uh, created, uh, this idea for a show, but he knew it would just never go nowhere, and he pitched it to us on a napkin. But basically, it's teddy bears reenacting the most violent Old Testament Bible <laughs> stories. Um, and so, and so, it's a cartoon show with teddy bears reenacting the most violent Old Testament Bible stories, um, and uh, it's hilarious, <laughs> and it's awesome, and it's a throwback to when you know uh, Looney Tunes characters were able to have guns, right? When Elmer Fudd actually had a gun and. And, and and Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd were fighting over the gun. Like they, they, there was always violence in cartoons, um, and 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 we've lost that, and we've lost that sort of uh, masculine boyhood, where 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 boys are intrigued with those sort of things. And there's ways to do it properly versus improperly. And uh, but uh, this show's really great. It's for that you know ten to twelve year old boy. Um, who's already playing Call of Duty? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. So we just wanted to expand. Like, what is what happens if we just become the punk rock of Christian film, uh, the MTV of, of of Christian entertainment? Like, what does that look like? How do we get make content that our that our kids uh, that our kids uh, uh, are into? Yeah, I mean, I think we're bubble wrapping children today in weird ways, and yet exposing them to things that are certainly inappropriate it's a it's kind of a two-step in a way we're going this way too far then kind of pulling yeah. back in a way that should be uh should be uh, fixed but it is interesting you know a, and, and why can't we tell that back. story <laughs> yeah there, there's a there's a definite balance to that uh the bubble wrapping the kids mm -hmm. we like we don't want to bubble wrap the kids but we don't want to place them in a uh a, a dangerous danger yeah we want our kids to be in danger like we want them to climb a tree we want them to experience uh, adventure and those sort of things and risk breaking a leg, right? So there's a sensible danger that it's okay to put your kids in. Uh, it, there, then there's unsensible danger. Um, and, and then, and, and so, and so what we want to do is we just want to give the filmmakers, Christian filmmakers, whether they're in Hollywood and trying to get out or whether in the faith-based film industry and trying to make something more, you know, uh, not as mannequin. Um, and, and what we want to do is just give them freedom to fail. Mm -hmm. Right. So like like that's something n no one in the film industry really gives people the freedom to fail because films are so expensive. Uh, but you see, though, that on on platforms like YouTube and platforms like TikTok, what we see now is really just an emphasis on storytelling done cheaply and well. And that's creating giant audiences. Um, so what we want to do is figure out what is the way we can get filmmakers to have the freedom to fail, they might make a they might make a show that is just absolutely revolting to the Christian audience, and that's okay because our 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 platform allows the monthly subscribers to decide what to fund, and so there's less risk there. We're not waiting for a big multi million dollar theater release mm -hmm. and hundreds of millions of dollars in P and A or whatever um, to to 
to be able to determine whether the movie's good, yeah. we'll know right away because the audience will buy it uh, before it's made in, in some instances. I want to get to the model in a minute, but also, are you finding that the, the light you're shining out at this point, the beacon as it were, is attracting people who are been, have been frustrated by traditional Hollywood, that they've had stories that they were itching to tell, but they know they can't tell them on NBC or at Netflix or any of the traditional platforms, and all of a sudden you come along, hey, you know, we're, we're looking to give this a try. Are you finding that, that you're inspiring and, and, and drawing in these people who have these visions? We were told unless we raised hundreds of millions of dollars, we wouldn't be able to get any decent content. <laughs> and uh, just yesterday, uh, our chief content officer got to speak to an Emmy writer, mm-hmm. an Emmy winner. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and and so uh, the amount and caliber of talent that we've been able to uh, connect with has been insane. Um, and we I don't think we expected it. And uh, uh, in fact, what we've started doing is once a month, we have artist gatherings for uh Uh, so we did one in Nashville, we did one in LA, one in Dallas. And then, uh, at the end of May and at NRB, we'll do one in Orlando. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to do New York and Atlanta, um, in June is the the plan tentatively. Uh, but every time we do these gatherings, we get 50 or 60 artists. Um, some of them, uh, you would absolutely recognize the work that they've worked on and they're all looking to get out of the, the, the secular film industry but they're not willing to make movies about ponies and and little girls Mm -hmm. for the faith-based film industry. Uh, So there's this massive middle. Nobody is, and I don't mean to be arrogant when I say that, but literally nobody is attacking that, that 18 to 35 year old men uh, who don't like to see strangers naked, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't see our competition with daily wire. I don't see our competition. I don't see daily wires competition. I don't see pure flex's competition. Our, our competitor is porn. Hmm. Right. So we, we just like, that's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're just trying to make uh great entertainment and stories that just don't have strangers naked. In it. Yeah. It's pretty much one of our only standards. Now so. the, the lore model is different. It's got a bit of streaming. It's got some crowdfunding elements in it. it give me your elevator pitch. Cause I, I want to make sure that people understand the core of this, why it's yeah. different, why it puts them in charge and why the content will be different than anything you see or out there right now. Yeah, so let's uh, so just start with every other streaming service. Uh, uh, the way it works is you 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 get your monthly subscription. A portion of your monthly subscription, is, let's say fifty percent of that fifteen dollars a month you spend in Netflix or Disney, is given to uh, Hollywood executives who hate your values, right? Um, and and they decide what sort of content you're going to see. And you sort of pay fifteen bucks a month, and you hope that you get content that uh, makes sense uh, for you or that you want to watch. Or in most instances, you forget to unsubscribe until the next season of Stranger (laughs) Things happens, right? Um, So that's literally how it works. Uh, So, But we decided is what if that 50% of the money that goes to the Hollywood executives, what if the subscriber actually had that power to be able to spend that money on individual projects, movies, and TV shows? Um, and so the way our, 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 our streaming platform works is I like to describe it as a video game where the horde of players are coming together online and they're building a streaming platform, one piece of content at a time. And so every week you'll get in-game currency we call loot, and you can spend that loot funding movies and TV shows uh, that you want to see. And that's basically a vote or an allocation of your monthly subscription dollars towards that content. So you get a bit of a, a description of here's a show we're considering, we're working on. It's in our sphere. Do you like this? Is this something you would watch? And you steer your loot in that direction. So you have a better yeah. say and sway so over what happens. That's, yeah. So basically it's a Kickstarter pitch um, where it's like, hey, we want to make this movie. Here's the projects we've done in the past. And here's why you really like this this thing, right? And why Lore is the only platform we could do it on. That's mm-hmm. pretty much how the pitch works. Um, and then uh, – but so that those are so those are for projects that uh, either the, the the projects that have not been made that are just maybe in a in a pitch deck sort of form, um, but fifty percent of our projects are already done. Um, so what the subscribers are doing there, they're just paying the distribution fees. Mm-hmm. Um, so so those stream those projects that are already done, those stream immediately as soon as they hit hundred percent of the distribution fee and funding. 
Um, so that's really exciting because you don't know when the premiere date of it's going to be. It's mm -hmm. you know it, we we and so that's a, a fun marketing challenge too, is we have to let people know, hey, this project's at ninety five percent. It'll be available to watch in probably about ten minutes. Interesting, <laughs> and you know I also well, think really that fun. that I think we're we're more willing to be in control of our content. You know, we have so many different things we can access right now and having a say over it, which is, is interesting because otherwise you just go on Netflix and you stream through the, the recently added file and see what's, what's up next. But now you're going to be able to have some, some kind of back and forth there. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the show about the, uh, the intriguing bears. Is there another project or TV show or, or even a film in lure TV's pipeline that you think really captures what you're all about in a sense? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so I, I mean, just one of the one of the 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 biggest extremes, I think, is we have a satirical uh, rom com called The Lesbian and the Lumberjack, mm -hmm. and it's about a lesbian who gets flat tire on the side of the road and gets rescued by a lumberjack and realizes she's not gay. She just never met a real man before. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh so, my gosh! <laughs> so right, so there, there's this extreme in terms of. Mm -hmm. That's a great story, and that hits to the left, like the left hits to the right. Right. Um, and it's funny, and it's you know, it's it, you know, it's just like a Hallmark Christmas movie, that sort of thing. Uh, but it, but it, it, but it's a masculine version of a Hallmark Christmas movie, right? Mm -hmm. It appeals to the man, um, and and so that's so 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 those those are the sort of things. But we also have a lot of really great content for kids. We have, uh, like I say, I mentioned barely biblical, um, and and we have. Uh, uh, a kid's show for two-year-olds uh, that uh, I don't quite want to announce yet, but it's done by someone who's really huge in the Christian, not the Christian, but the secular mm -hmm. children's entertainment industry. Um, and then, um, uh, and then, and then, and then a lot of the shows are just, they're just good shows for like maybe teenagers um, and, and, and that sort of thing. We have 40 projects lined up. Um, Black, Black, uh, well, one of the projects we have is Black Rose Ballad. Um, and it's a Western about, uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it's described as a violent Western of a man, uh, uh, seeking vengeance on, uh, those who, who I, I could, I'm probably getting this wrong, but, but, but it's, a it's, a seeking, seeking vengeance on those who pretend to be holy. Right. Okay. Um, so, so, so there's this, that sort of thing. And, um, there's just a lot of really great content that, that we have. And, um, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> my chief content officer knows all these projects off the drop of a hat. I have to pull up the website. Cause no, that's all right. There's just been so many. Let, let me, let me pull that up real quick. Sure. I'll be way more accurate. With well, I also want to ask you about lore redacted, which definitely got my spider senses going because it sounds like what I hear all the time within Hollywood, where there are artists and they want to do different stories, but they know if they do them, there could be career punishment. They can't, you know, they can't be associated with X or Y. Is that what I'm thinking it is as far as redacted goes, yeah. where artists are able to kind of create and maybe go under a pseudonym and still be able to share the stories they want to share? Yeah. So, you know, one of Christian's superpowers is that uh, that is that of humility, right? Um, so, so we're not always vying for attention and seeking fame. Um, so there's a lot of people in Hollywood, uh, who have, uh, I mean, they work for Emmy winning shows. We've spoken to these guys and they're basically undercover. Um, and they're, they want to make content, uh, but they don't want to be exposed. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, which is what, well, which is, uh, which I think is wise because the, the Christian conservative film industry isn't at the level yet that they can afford their salaries um so but they're also in a position where they can't do anything low budget or fun on the side either <laughs> because hollywood will shut them out and then you have the union rules and all those other things so but it, it's not so much the things. union rules i think it's more about the you can't tell these kind of stories because then it may reflect poorly on your other career i mean that's that's what i cover from gosh week to week day right. to day month to month it's it's you know I, i've spoken about it recently with the, the host of red pilled america if you're an artist and you share certain views even if those views are shared by half the country or more there could be consequences and I, it's a terrible place yeah. to be, but I, yeah. I appreciate that there's a lore TV out there giving them the chance. Yeah, but, but lore redacted is basically for, uh, for, for artists who, you know, directed by redacted. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and so that's really fun and exciting concept that I don't think anybody's doing. I think the Christian worldview really allows us to be able to do that, to be able to find artists who are not really 
thrilled about their name mm-hmm. being out there yet because they don't want to risk the job, but they still want to make great stories that are compelling um, and uh, according to their values. And so I think that's really where a lot of the, the power comes in. But uh, going back to the content, and now that I've pulled this slide up, <laughs> um, uh, Gothics is a documentary that's coming out. Gothics was a Twitch streamer. I think she still is a Twitch streamer, but she basically made a comment that said, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't think, and, and by the way, she's a, she's a, she's a black woman. And she made a comment and said, I, I don't think it's racist. If you disagree with the little mermaid being recasted as a black person. And she basically got just trashed by the woke mob on Twitch and basically had to get off of Twitch for a time, uh, because, and they tried to destroy her life. Um, and so this is a whole documentary on, on that, um, on, on her being a Twitch streamer and how she rose in fame and basically lost it all because she didn't agree with the woke mob and she yeah. became conservative and red pill in the process. <laughs> for for so, having uh, an opinion and being a black person who doesn't agree with maybe the majority of her peers, that's, that's the crime. Yeah. And the, the other project I'm really excited about is Churchville, which is like a mixture of like the office and sketch comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but it's basically about two competing mega church pastors uh, who, uh, who are, are, are vying for each other's uh, audience. Mm-hmm. Um, really great, really great parody of mega churches and, and the ridiculousness of some of the big, the bigger mega churches in our country. Really funny. Um, it's actually written by brilliant comedians. Um, and I think, honestly, I think that's, which is probably going to be one of our biggest hits. And I think that's and part of Go ahead. We should what? <laughs> we shouldn't have it. It was rejected uh, by uh, the political conservative crowd because it was too Christian. Uh-huh. And then and it was rejected by the Christian crowd because it was too edgy. Um, and so somehow it wound up in our lap. That's and, right. And, and Which is a real gift. Yeah, um, absolutely. But that, that, that tells you exactly kind of where we're at. You know, I think the words culture war have been thrown around a lot lately. And I think that for the average person, they would say, well, gosh, it's just a TV show. It's just a movie. How does this involve my life? Why would you think this is a culture war? But I think even those people are starting to understand what's at stake here, why these things do matter. Uh, From your perspective, how do you see Lord TV engaging in the culture war? I mean, it sounds like it may sound like an obvious question, but, you know, if someone kind of poo poos that idea that the, that it's, it's not, it's just TV shows. What's the big deal? What, what, you, what, why are we arguing? It's, you know, it's not, it's not a vote. It's not a, a, a public proclamation. It's just TV. What, what would you say to that? Well, I, I would think Hollywood would disagree that it's just TV. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I think uh, if, I mean, just last night, Trump came on CNN, right. And, uh, and he was just, uh, the left was just trashing CNN for just giving the man a platform. Mm -hmm. Right. So they know the power of their networks, uh, for, for hiding truth or, or providing their version of it. Right. Um, so, so the same is true with Hollywood. Um, uh, you know, there, there's a reason why there's a, a LGBT character in, in, in every single show you watch. And, and it just shows that we're just watching, I'm one of the one of my favorite shows right now is Ted Lasso, one of the best shows on a really biblical view of masculinity I've ever seen in my life. And this entire season has like they made it go three seasons without any LGBT narrative whatsoever. And and now all of a sudden, like every episode is that. And it's like, why did this have to happen? And you can tell the writers of, of Ted Lasso don't want it in there because it's not done well. Ability. No. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on the show and also for creating something truly novel, truly different. And when all those other pitches get rejected, they're going to come to Lore TV and they're going to have a home there, which is going to be really interesting. And of course, Lore TV is launching very soon, May 22nd. Uh, the official launch is at the NRB conference, but people will be able to check it out everywhere. Go to lore.tv. That's o- L-O-O-R dot TV. You can join the wait list. And as soon as it goes live, you jump right in, start uh, waving that loot around, making your choices and getting some content you've never seen before. So uh, thank you, Marcus, and uh, best of luck. Thank you. All right, it's time for your weekly tip before we say goodbye. Remember comedy? It used to be a really big reason why we went to the movies in the first place. Step Brothers, Old School, Bridesmaids, oh, great movies. They don't make them like that anymore. And in some cases, they don't make them at all. I have a recent story at HollywoodInToto.com that shares how so few comedies are making it to theaters in recent years. The numbers don't lie. But a rare and welcome exception was Game Night. came out in 2018, not too, too long ago, but it feels like a lifetime ago. And it starred Jason Bateman and Rachel McAdams. 
They're board game fanatics, and they get in way over their heads in this reality game. I'll say no more about the story because there's a lot of surprises, a lot of twists and turns. You want to enjoy them fresh if you haven't seen it yet. But it's probably one of the better theatrical comedies in recent years. I'd say Free Guy is another one, but again, these are the exceptions. The game night is dark, it's funny, definitely woke free. That was surprising and nice for sure when I rewatched it recently. Plus, the great Jesse Plemons is here. He steals the movie. They should put him on a most wanted list. It's such a, an abject case of thievery. He's great. So the film didn't bomb at the box office. It made nearly $70 million, stateside at least, and some more overseas. But, you know, I think that people got the joke at the time, and they'll certainly enjoy it now. And that's a good thing because it's streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Now, before we go, I just want to say... Would you mind giving the HitCast a little love on iTunes, a little five-star review? would be wonderful. Or maybe just sharing this episode or even other episodes you've enjoyed on social media, perhaps ye old Twitter, which we mentioned before. If you do both, I promise I will not include you in my will because you don't want to spend all those hours counting pennies. It's exhausting. See you next time.